The federal courthouse outside of Boston does not have cameras in it. If it did, it might have been a real rival to the Zimmerman trial for being the epicenter of the media universe this past week. Because simultaneously in the Boston federal courthouse, we've had the ongoing trial of Whitey Bulger, at which the missing for 16 years Boston mob boss criminal mastermind is now found and in custody and charged with killing 19 people in a reign of terror that captivated and enthralled and terrified Boston for decades. And, and at the same time, at the same courthouse, this past week, there was also another totally spellbinding thing happening in that same courthouse. Again, where there are no cameras, but there at least is a sketch artist. And where a phalanx of federal, state, and local law enforcement put on a major display of military-style force to bring the surviving Boston bombing suspect into the courtroom, where he ultimately pled not guilty to 30 charges, including use of a weapon of mass destruction to kill. The charges could not get him the death penalty under Massachusetts law, but they could very well get him the death penalty under federal law, and he is being federally charged. While all that happens, though, there remain as mysteries on the edges of this story, a gruesome horror movie of an unsolved triple murder and an equally mysterious, totally unexplained FBI killing. And these persist as mysteries on the edges of these other cases. And frankly, they are getting weirder and worse now just about every day. It starts in Waltham, Massachusetts, on the 10th anniversary of 9-11. It was September 11th, 2011. Three young men, two of whom were athletes, one a martial arts fighter, another a personal trainer, big, fit, strong young guys. They ended up murdered in particularly gruesome fashion on a quiet, dead-end street. Waltham is a suburb of Boston, and there is no place in the world where crimes like this are common, but particularly in this place, it is a very strange thing to have happened. These are the three young men who died. They were found with their throats slit in three different rooms of a single apartment, in this house in Waltham. Reportedly, they were all found in the same position, their bodies all facing down, their heads all turned and tilted the same direction to the exact same angle, their throats slit, and their bodies strewn with drugs. There was marijuana all over them. One of the young men who was killed is reported to have been a small-time pot dealer, but there were the three dead bodies covered in loose marijuana. There was also $5,000 in cash found in the apartment. It was left there. And the killers escaped. When Tamerlan Sarnayev, the older of the two Sarnayev brothers, was named as a suspect in the Boston bombings, and then he was later killed in an explosives and bullet-laden confrontation with police, this cold case Waltham triple murder got back into the news because it turns out that Tamerlan Sarnayev was friends with one of the men who was killed. They were about the same age, they worked out at the same gym, they were both fighters, and they were reportedly very close friends. Is it possible that there was more than just a coincidental connection between these two crimes, between the Boston bombing and this unsolved triple murder? Could Tamerlan Sarnayev have been the perpetrator of both of these crimes two years apart? Those questions are why the Waltham case ended up back in the news after the marathon bombing. After Tamerlan Sarnayev was killed and the younger Sarnayev brother was taken into custody, FBI agents and Massachusetts state police officers went to Central Florida to interview another friend of Tamerlan Sarnayev in relation to, well, we don't know, presumably in relation to the Boston bombing investigation, right? Presumably the investigation into the Boston Marathon bombing continues now even to look into whether or not the Sarnayev brothers are connected to anybody else in this country who should be seen as potentially culpable for that crime. So the questioning of this guy in Orlando could have been about the Boston bombing. But could it have also have been about those Waltham murders? Does that explain why Massachusetts state police officers were there along with those FBI agents in that apartment in Orlando, Florida, when the man who they were questioning ended up dead? Ibrahim Todeshev was 27 years old. No sources, anonymous or otherwise, have ever suggested that he had any connection to the marathon bombing whatsoever, other than the fact that he had a personal friendship with Tamerlan Sarnayev some years earlier when he'd lived in Boston. But the FBI and apparently the Massachusetts State Police kept questioning him over and over and over again anyway. What were they questioning him about? And it it was the fifth interview they had done with him. where They were in his apartment on May 22nd. They were hours into the interview. There was nobody else there as far as we know besides Mr. Todeshev and at least three law enforcement officers. But they ended up killing him, ended up shooting him and killing him. We don't know officially how many times they shot him, although his family released photos that were supposedly taken of his body at the morgue, which appear to show his body shot six times in the torso and once in the back of the head. Why did they shoot this guy seven times? 
when you look at all the different anonymous law enforcement leaks about why they shot this guy, the list of things leaked to the press anonymously by law enforcement about why they had to shoot this guy seven times, including in the back of the head, the list, honestly, is nonsense. He had a knife, say three law enforcement sources. Oh, and then two of those sources say, no, 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 he did not have a knife. So the third one still says he has a knife? Well, I don't know. Nobody ever clarified that. Somebody else, some other law enforcement sources, says he had a blade. A blade that's different than a knife? No, wait a minute. Another law enforcement source says, no, 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 he did not have a blade. So it's no knife and no blade. Did he have something else? Oh, he had a pole. He had a pole, or maybe it was a broomstick. No, no, he had a ceremonial sword. No, he did not have a ceremonial sword. Well, there might have been a ceremonial sword somewhere, but he didn't have it anywhere near him during the questioning. Okay, then why are we even talking about this sword then? Or maybe he pushed a table. Or maybe he threw a chair. Are you guys sure now? Is that why you shot him? You want to settle on one self-exculpatory story here? Or do you want to stick to six or seven different self-exculpatory stories that can't all possibly be true? And at each of those turns in the story, where the material fact of what this guy supposedly had is represented in a totally new and different way, when only law enforcement was in the room with him and nobody else can testify to it, each new turn in the story is reported as, ah, the thing this kid definitely had in his hand or did to provoke getting shot seven times. All of these conflicting stories cannot all be true. The only thing they have in common is that they all excuse the killing by law enforcement in about seven different inconsistent ways that cannot all possibly coexist. No other authorities are investigating the shooting. There's no local Florida police investigation of the shooting. The FBI is looking into itself on this one. Charlie Savage reporting in the New York Times last month that the internal shooting review process that the FBI is conducting about itself and its behavior here is a process that over the last 20 years has reviewed more than 150 shootings. And in zero of those 150 cases has the internal review process found that the FBI did anything wrong. But we're supposed to believe that this time, this internal review process means that we'll all get the straight story soon. Just be patient. Florida authorities say they're waiting for the FBI's review of itself to cough up its foregone conclusion. I mean its conclusion. The FBI says they're making no public comments about the case until they finish this very important internal review. They're also forbidding any other officials from releasing any other agency's information about this case. The Florida Medical Examiner's Office saying today that the FBI is blocking them from releasing Todashev's autopsy report, even though the medical examiner says the report is ready for release. In terms of any other kind of oversight, well, there's Congress. The FBI has now written a letter to the House Homeland Security Committee telling the committee that the FBI, quote, will not be responding to all of the committee's requests for information. See, ongoing investigations, you know how it is. So even Congress, no, we're not telling you. Now, though, even things, things, things are getting even, even weirder than they have been. And in some ways, they're getting worse. The Boston Globe reporting that after killing Ibrahim Todashev, Federal authorities have now arrested his roommate from that Florida apartment where he was killed. They have put her in jail on immigration violations. She will reportedly stay in jail until she is deported back to Russia. The Boston Globe describing her as a potential witness to the murder of Ibrahim Todashev, one of the only potential witnesses who is not an FBI agent or another law enforcement official. The Globe noting that both the immigration court, which makes the decision about deporting her, and the FBI, which killed her roommate, that she might have been a witness to, both the court and the FBI fall under the purview of the Department of Justice, which conceivably could be a conflict of interest, no? Right now, the plan is that this potential witness will remain in jail until she is deported, and when she is deported, she will be brought to the airport by law enforcement authorities. In other words, if you want to talk to her about what she may have witnessed, good luck with that. Try tracking her down in Russia. And she conceivably is the only witness. Meanwhile, anonymous law enforcement sources have not only continued to try the killing of Ibrahim Todashev through media leaks, they've also continued to sell that gruesome murder mystery in Waltham, Massachusetts, as something that's all tied up. It's totally solved. And they've tried to sell that by leaking that information anonymously as well. Last week, the New York Times front-paged a really weird story about this whole mess. It was a weird story, not necessarily just because of the details of the story, but because of the way they reported it. Ever since Ibrahim Todashev was killed, in addition to leaking about the weapons that he may or may not have had and his supposed actions just before being shot, ever since they killed him, law enforcement officials have also been leaking to the media that Ibrahim Todashev was a villain. 
that he basically confessed that both he and Tamar Lynn Sarnayev, who conveniently is also dead, uh, they were the ones who committed that gruesome murder in Waltham in 2011. And last week, the New York Times story on the front page just bought that anonymously sourced theory and, in fact, reported it as if the paper had checked it out and knew it to be true somehow. The New York Times writing that Ibrahim Todeshev definitely did implicate himself and Tamerlan Sarnayev in those Waltham murders. Quote, an FBI agent investigating the bombings interviewed Mr. Todeshev about Mr. Sarnayev in his Orlando apartment in May, and he began to provide information about the Waltham case, says the FBI. The nature of Mr. Todeshev's sudden admission and shooting have left some close to the victim skeptical about the official account of what happened. Why would they be skeptical? We're being told he definitely confessed, right? At one point they said he had a knife, too, and then they said he didn't. The FBI has never released any proof publicly that there was any confession prior to the Todeshev killing. But now the New York Times says, hey, surprise, that grisly case has been solved. In which case, big news, front page, and a weird form of justice for those three guys who were killed in Waltham, who are now having it implied to their loved ones who are mourning their loss, having it implied to them through anonymous law enforcement leaks that are apparently not part of a real investigation or a real trial, that their three loved ones were conveniently killed by a couple of dead guys, and so case closed. Really? James Comey just went through his confirmation hearings process to be the new director of the FBI. There were zero questions for him throughout the process about who shot Ibrahim Todeshev and who has been leaking and continues to leak all these self-contradictory but always self-exculpatory lies about him thus far that we're still being told to believe. This is a farce. I don't know why this isn't a bigger national story, but this is an absolute farce.